Thanks very much. Um, so uh, I'm a postdoc uh, at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne. Um, I'm also associated, well, affiliated with um, a Centre of Research Excellence in Infectious Disease Modelling, PRISM Square. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about Group A Streptococcus um, infection. So before I start, I'd just like to um, thank the organisers and also the ICTS for uh, enabling me to come here and, and participate during this week. Okay, so Group A Streptococcus is uh, it's a human pathogen. Um, doesn't live in the environment, just in humans. Uh, it mostly causes mild infections, so throat infections, which you might um, you might have heard of strep throat. Uh, group A Streptococcus is the bug responsible for that. Uh, it also causes skin infections. Um, and these mild infections are generally easily treated with antibiotics. There's very low rates of resistance to antibiotics in group A strep. Um, but the reason why we're interested in it is because if you, uh, if, well, there are a number of hypotheses, but group A streptococcus mild infections can lead to um, immune dysfunction um, and chronic diseases, which can affect the heart and kidneys. Um, they can also cause invasive infections. And these, these other diseases that group A strep is responsible for um, can have quite high mortality rates. Um, so globally, uh, group A strep uh, is responsible for about half a million deaths a year, and that's kind of the same order of mange as measles and pertussis. So it's quite uh, an important um, pathogen to take an interest in. Uh, it's also interesting if we, uh, in that it, it's quite a diverse pathogen. So there are over 200 molecular sequence types of group A streptococcus. Uh, and these, um, we tend to see a lot more sequence types circulating in populations that have a high prevalence of these um, serious group A strep diseases. So what I have here is a plot um, of the prevalence of rheumatic heart disease uh, in populations uh, uh, against the, uh, a measure of the number of strains in the population, which is the Simpson's reciprocal index of diversity. And what we see is that you tend to either have populations with low um, prevalence of disease, uh, and these have quite low a number of strains circulating in the population, or you see um, high prevalence of disease and a high diversity. Uh, and uh, we have a couple of outliers here, um, but generally you just get these, this kind of dichotomy of, of epidemiology. And so if we have a look at um, what happens in one of these populations which have quite a low prevalence, um, so we look at uh, this, so I've got some data here from uh, uh, I think five sites in the, in the United States um, uh, over a five year period. And what you see is that, so this is a plot of the relative prevalence of different strains uh, over time. And you can see that the relative prevalence of particular strains is relatively stable over time. Um, approximately half of them uh, of, of the disease is made up of only a few sequence types. Um, uh, and in this population, we get really low prevalence of rheumatic heart disease. Uh, and the major kind of, uh, the major uh, manifestation of mild infection is throat infection. Uh, if we look at uh, a hyperendemic population like uh, indigenous populations in Australia, we see quite a different, um, quite different dynamics over time. So here we've got um, strains circulating and coming in and out of the population. So actually what I should say first of all is that this is just one community as opposed to five sites in America. This time scale is two years as opposed to five years. There's only 218 isolates here before we had 5,000. So you can see even though we've got um, uh, we're looking at less people and fewer isolates, we have much more diversity and this diversity is changing over time. And so in, um, in the Australian context, in our Indigenous populations, we have actually the highest rates of rheumatic heart disease in the world. Um, and this is what the, uh, the dynamics look like of infection. Uh, and so for Australia, um, group A strep disease dis disproportionately affects our Indigenous population. Uh, so I've got some stats up here. Uh, an Indigenous Australian is 64 times more likely to develop RHD during their lifetimes, and then also 20 times more likely to die from it 
um, than a non-Indigenous Australian. Um, and also, if we look at the age distribution of acute rheumatic fever, and which is kind of a precursor to rheumatic heart disease and also rheumatic heart disease, uh, we see that most cases actually happen in, in young as opposed to uh, in Indigenous Australians, so the pink bars. Uh, if we look at non-Indigenous Australians, the bulk of the, um, of the disease burden is in the elderly. So quite different, um, quite different disease distributions. Uh, we don't really know why uh, it's group A strep is a much bigger problem in Indigenous Australians than in non-Indigenous Australians. We know that there are a number of risk factors for infection. Um, so there's been some studies done in uh, military bases in America over the years, and they've looked at the effect of living in close uh, or having crowded living conditions. This is a risk factor for infection. Uh, poor health, uh, inadequate um, health hardware in your home, which is essentially being able to wash and be clean. Uh, those facilities are uh, inadequate. Um, you're also more likely to be infected with group A strep if you have um, other infections. So if you're co-infected with um, bugs like scabies, which creates a break in the skin, and this allows, uh, well, it's thought to allow um, uh, uh, group A strep to take a foothold and, and become and kind of opportunistically infect. So in Australia, we've recognised that group A strep is a problem in the past uh, and that we've tried to do something about this. Um, we've most of the past interventions that we've been using have been treatment-based. So looking at mass drug administrations um, against um, scabies and skin sores. And these um, interventions have had some success over the short term, but in the long run, the, this success isn't sustained. Um, and so when we talk to um, our collaborators uh, who are clinicians and also uh, in public health, there's a general consensus that future interventions really need to try and target um, the primary, um, well, the, the risk factors that lead to infection, so primordial factors, but also um, prevent infection um, through a vaccine. So currently, we don't have a vaccine against group A strep. There are a number in the pipeline. Um, the Australian government have just um, uh, announced that they're going to spend $35 million on Australian dollars to develop a vaccine against group A strep. This is great news. But realistically, the vaccine is a long way off. Um, and we really want to be able to do something about group A strep infections um, now, because that, the longer we wait for a vaccine, the more young people get affected with rheumatic heart disease and, effect, and it affects their quality of life. So there are a number of approaches that, we were, um, that could be taken to combat group A strep uh, and the diseases associated with group A strep infection. Um, and I've just listed a few up here. Um, screening and treatment is kind of, and mass, mass drug administrations is what we've done in the past. Um, uh, our, um, our collaborators suggest that we should be focusing on these, um, these types of interventions where we uh, do something like an education campaign to deliver um, uh, advice on how people should um, take care of their personal hygiene and also how they can prevent infection better. Um, what can we do in terms of housing um, infrastructure? So should we build more houses? Should we uh, affect, uh, should we um, improve current housing? And also um, another possible intervention that people have been talking about is trying to improve maintenance programs because um, it's okay to, um, to build new houses and to um, provide more health, uh, more adequate health hardware, but these things break. And so we need um, maintenance programs to allow these um, effects to be sustained over time. And so there's a number of things that could be done. And the question is, what should be done? Uh, and that's where our kind of um, modeling works come in. So our aim is really to try and figure out the best combination of um, non-vaccine interventions to uh, achieve sustained reductions in the prevalence of group A strep diseases in Australian Indigenous populations. Uh, and we want to use modeling um, to, to achieve this. Uh, and so we, when we decided we're going to build the model of group A strep infection uh, and transmission, uh, we went to the literature to find out, well, who's, who's modelled group A strep before? And we found out that no one has. Uh, and so we kind of have to start from scratch. Uh, and we came up against quite a significant roadblock, and that is that we don't really understand what leads um, from infection to these more uh, significant diseases. 
but also we don't really understand their immune response um, to infection. Um, so we don't really know if it's strain specific, if, if there's cross strain immunity, we don't know how long immunity takes, um, or how long immunity lasts. Uh, we don't know the kind of infection history that you need in order to achieve sustained uh, immunity. Um, and so this is kind of uh, uh, you know, a bit of a roadblock, but um, we have this data about um, the global epidemiology of group A strep across different populations. And we were wondering, well, can we use this to try and back out some details about what has to go on within the host uh, in order to see these kind of population level observations? Uh, and this is kind of, uh, I think this is, uh, well, we decided we would use a model to try and answer that question. Uh, so our approach was to build a very general model of um, multi-strain transmission, uh, and then ask what kind of conditions that we have to specify within hosts that would lead to this type of population level patterns where you either see low prevalence uh, and uh, in combination with low diversity, or high prevalence in combination with high diversity. Okay, so set one, we built a model. Um, so we, there are a number of things that our model needed to capture. Number one being uh, we needed to capture strain diversity. Um, so we decided to build a multi-strain model. Um, and our model needed to be able to capture uh, a lot of flexibility in the within host dynamics because we kind of wanted to tune these in order to figure out what conditions would lead to these population level patterns. So we needed flexibility in our within host dynamics, we needed a multi-strain model, uh, and there are plenty of other multi-strain models floating around in the literature. I've just named a couple, uh, uh, a couple of examples here um, that have been looking at streptococcus pneumoniae, but also uh, uh, Neisseria meningitides. Uh, and so we kind of started here uh, and then um, kind of moved on. So our model has uh, a number of strains, N strains, and the number of strains in the population changes over time. Uh, we make the very simplifying assumption that all of the strains in our model are functionally identical, um, it's because we don't know otherwise, um, but that they can potentially prompt a distinct immune response in the host. Um, so the infection model that we're choosing to use is an SIRS type model, so we've got susceptible people infected and recovered, and then people that uh, recover, can lose their immunity and become susceptible again. And we also assume um, that uh, we also allow people to be co-infected with multiple strains, but also to have actual multiple sites of infection on their body. So because we have so many strains and we want to take account of people's uh, 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 immune and infection status with respect to these individual strains, we chose to use an agent-based bottling approach because trying to write down uh, equations for um, hundreds of uh, different states that uh, a host can be in is going to be very difficult uh, and very difficult to parameterize. Uh, so we chose a modeling, uh, an agent-based modeling approach uh, where our agents correspond to hosts and we track their infection and immune status with respect to each strain in the model uh, and our agents also have an age. So we assume that our population has a, a constant number of hosts but we do allow um, uh, our population to for susceptibles to be replenished in our population through um, birth and death processes, but these balance. Uh, we also allow, um, we also take into account host migration, and this can be bring in both susceptible and infected people into our population. Um, okay, so the within host dynamics, I said before that we um, take account, into account co infection, and we do this uh, by not explicitly modeling um, uh, competition between strains within a host but by um, taking a co-infection type modeling approach where uh, we just, um, we, uh, we don't actually model infection dynamically, we just say you're infected um, with different strains uh, and you can be infected with up to uh, a, a carrying capacity of number of strains. So we assume that um, like other co-infection co type modeling models, we assume that strains um, can't be displaced by other strains in a host, they have, in order to be, if you're at infection carrying capacity, then in order to be infected again, you need to clear at least one of those infections. Uh, but we do uh, incorporate into the model um, that hosts that are infected are less susceptible to being infected, um, uh, to being co or to being infected by another strain. 
and I'll kind of talk about that in a bit more detail later. So as I said before, the model has flexibility in um, the within host um, processes, within hosts, uh, and in particular we've got four parameters, oh, sorry, yep, four parameters um, that we kind of, uh, we don't know much about, but allows us to tune the level of resistance of hosts to being uh, co-infected, which is X. Um, we have a parameter for, uh, that defines the strength of strain-specific immunity and also uh, cross-protective immunity. Uh, and, and the mean duration of immunity is also um, a, a parameter in a model that we can play with. So in terms of the between host dynamics, um, we assume that our population is well mixed. Um, this is just, uh, this is an overly, uh, overly simplifying assumption, but um, because we've got so much other stuff going on in the model, we want to really figure out how um, these within host um, uh, parameters are affecting the overall dynamics. We just make this simplifying assumption. Uh, and we, each time step in our model, we simulate contacts between agents. Um, and so uh, we do this in such a way that on average hosts have uh, a constant number of, oh, on average a, cons a constant number C, a number of contacts with other hosts per time step. Uh, we assume that transmission can only occur if there's contact with an infected host, so you can't get infected from um, the environment or something. And uh, we specify, um, we determine a host, uh, the probability of infection um, uh, from a contact between uh, a host with another host uh, affected by a particular strain J um, with this equation here. So this is made up of kind of a base probability of transmission beta, which is the same for every strain. It doesn't depend on um, strain. Uh, and then this is, um, uh, there's an effect of the host's current infection status, which um, can reduce the susceptibility of the host um, according to the host's um, current infection status, and then also an effect due to their infection history, so their immunity. So I'll just go into these um, parts uh, in a bit more detail. So uh, this effect of the host's um, current infection status on its susceptibility is given by this function here. Sectionally, it's a decreasing function of the number of infections that a host has. Um, so, uh, and this kind of effect is um, scaled by this parameter X, which I'm calling the resistance to co-infection and also this ca carrying capacity for infection kappa. Uh, and this, is, this kind of term is supposed to encapsulate the fact that um, uh, infections that are already present in the host have a competitive advantage over uh, infections that are coming in. So a host is less likely to be infected if they already have infections. So this term here, which depends on the host's uh, uh, current uh, immune status, um, uh, is, is given here. So if a host currently ha uh, has immunity to a particular strain J, then um, their susceptibility is reduced by 1 minus the strength of strain specific immunity sigma. If they don't have immunity to this particular strain, but they have immunity to another strain, then this, um, this factor is 1 minus the strength of cross-strain immunity omega. Uh, we assume that um, this cross-strain immunity can only be as great as strain-specific immunity. So we assume that strain-specific immunity is generally more effective than cross-strain immunity um, at reducing a host susceptibility. And S is just equal to 1 if, um, if the host currently doesn't have any immunity. Um, so what I should say is that when a host clears an infection, they gain immunity to whatever strain that they've just cleared. Um, and that's how you um, figure out a host's immune status. So because our uh, strains in our model uh, are essentially identical in terms of um, transmission and recovery, we can write down uh, an expression for the basic reproduction number. So for those who are not familiar with the basic reproduction number, it's a measure of transmissibility, and it's essentially the expected number of secondary infections caused by uh, one case of infection introduced into a completely susceptible population. And it just here it depends on our contact rate C, our pro base probability of transmission beta, gamma is um, uh, our recovery rate, D is our death rate, and alpha is the migration rate. Okay, so now we have our model. We want to ask what kind of parameter combinations um, will give us uh, this kind of uh, these cut and pat patterns of transmission. 
Okay, so first of all, in order to figure out whether our model can give us these patterns of transmission, we need to be able to measure prevalence and diversity in our model. Uh, and because our data comes in the form of um, the diversity being measured in uh, Simpson's reciprocal index of, of diversity, we just use this for our, um, to measure diversity in our model. Uh, and prevalence is just the percentage of the population that have at least one infection. So notice here that we're, we're kind of, um, we, because we don't have any um, serious disease uh, represented in our model, we're kind of equating um, prevalence of infection to some kind of um, measure of the prevalence of these more severe diseases in the population. Okay, so turns out um, that there are diversity regimes in our um, agent-based model, um, and these are governed by the level of resistance to co-infection X, the strength of cross-strain immunity omega, and the strength of strain-specific immunity sigma. So when we have high resistance to co-infection, so when X is big, um, we get two diversity regimes. Um, essentially, uh, oh sorry, we get three diversity regimes. Um, if uh, we don't have any immunity, so we essentially just have an SIS model, then uh, we lose, uh, we have very low level of diversity in the population. So in this uh, column here, I'm looking at the case where sigma and omega are both equal to zero. Uh, and so you can see that, um, so here I've got the total number of infections of each strain, so each colour represents a strain over time. At the end of the simulation, I've looked at um, the, the number or the proportion of hosts with a particular number of infections, so this represents um, kind of the degree of co-infection, this distribution. And on this plot here, I'm looking at the prevalence, which is the black line over time, and diversity is the blue line over time. And you can see that we have quite high, divert, uh, quite high prevalence because we have no immunity, which is uh, to push down the prevalence and we have quite a uh, low diversity, so we're just getting, in the end, if you run this for long enough, you end up just with one strain. If we increase the um, amount of strain-specific immunity um, in the model, so we uh, increase, we have a high level, of a high sigma value, then we can get the maintenance of a much higher level of diversity in the population. Uh, and the prevalence can also, is uh, doesn't, drop that much uh, if you look at the case, comparing this to the case without any immunity. Um, and because we have a high resistance to co-infection, of course, we only have, most of our infected hosts just have one infection. However, if we increase the degree of, or the uh, strength of cross-strain immunity omega, then we start to lose diversity. We also lose prevalence because um, we have a, a much higher level of immunity overall in the population. So we can see how we get quite a low um, diversity and also prevalence. If instead we consider the case where we have a low resistance to co-infection, um, so a low X, then we only end up with two diversity regimes. So if you have a low level of cross, uh, strength of cross-strain immunity, omega, um, then you get quite high uh, diversity uh, and high prevalence. If you increase the cross-strain immunity, then you lose diversity. Um, so you can see in this case before, uh, when, we, when we were looking at the high resistance to co-infection case, before we had quite a low diversity, but here we're getting the maintenance of a much higher level of diversity. Um, and if we look at the co-infection distributions, um, where we have a high enough prevalence, we see that we get kind of a, a more people having more than one infection who are infected. Okay, so that's all well and good. Um, so in order to figure, figure those results out, um, what we did was that we systematically looked at the effects of each parameter. So it was a kind of um, sensitivity analysis. So here I've just uh, got the results of, of many simulations and uh, what I've done for each plot here. So first of all, I'm, what I'm gonna show you is uh, in this column, we've got mean diversity at the end of the simulation. Um, so I've allowed my model to hit kind of an endemic equilibrium. Here I've got the, um, uh, the corresponding results for the mean prevalence of the, at the end of the simulation, and here I've got the mean number of co-infections per infected host at the end of uh, the simulation. Uh, and this top row refers to the case where we have low resistance to co-infection, this bottom case is high resistance to co-infection, and each dot, or each square, sorry, represents um, uh, the average of a number of simulations of our model um, for a specific value of 
strength, uh, strength of strength specific immunity on the horizontal axes and the strength of cross strain immunity on the vertical axis. Bit of a mouthful. <laughs> but um, what we see is that if we look at diversity, um, if we just compare, oh, actually, let's do this systematically. So let's have a look at the effect of um, the strength of cross strain immunity. What we see is that when we increase cross strain immunity across the board, we always see uh, a reduction in prevalence and diversity, no matter kind of what regime you're in, uh, what level of resistance to co-infection you have, X. So what I, to represent that kind of effect, what I have here in the middle is our um, within host mechanism. So we've got cross-strain immunity, strain specific immunity, and co-infection. And here are our kind of population level statistics that are describing um, transmission. And so just by looking at the effect of cross-strain immunity, we can see that it reduces the rate of pre uh, the prevalence if we increase cross-strain immunity, and it also in, uh, decreases diversity, and that's because, um, so there's a kind of feedback. So if, for instance, if you have strain-specific immunity only and no cross-strain immunity in the population, uh, and you get, uh, and you have a more abundant strain um, at some time point, that's going to lead to a lot of immunity to that strain, um, which is going to force the level of that strain, the prevalence of that individual strain to go down. So there's a kind of a feedback here. By allowing cross immunity, you reduce that effect. Uh, and it, so it increases the competitive advantage of more abundant strains um, because it takes away that negative feedback. Um, okay. Okay, let's have a look at what happens when we increase the strength of um, strain specific immunity on prevalence uh, in both of these regimes, what we see, increasing strain specific immunity both decreases the prevalence and um, uh, decreases the, the prevalence um, kind of in both of these uh, regimes. So, um, and that's because of, um, it essentially just reduces the prevalence of each strain. Um, if you have a look at the effect on diversity, this is kind of what I was talking about before, there's two effects. Um, so. Increasing strain diversity um, has um, uh, reduces the the effect. Oh, sorry, increases the competitiveness of less abundant strains, which increases the diversity. Um, but it also has the effect of reducing um, the effectiveness of immunity. Oh, so diversity also has the uh, corresponding effect of reducing the effectiveness of immunity, um, because um, the more diverse your population is, or the more diverse your um, strain population is the less likely that if you have strain specific immunity to a particular strain that you're going to actually have to be able to use that um, because you're less likely to encounter someone with the same strain. Okay, now let's look at the effect of um, increasing uh, the amount of co-infection in the model. So when we do this and we look at prevalence, we see that uh, the prevalence grows up when the more co-infection you have in your population. This kind of is pretty straightforward to see um, the more infection, uh, the more um, infections you allow in the population by having more co-infection, the higher your overall prevalence will be. Uh, if you look at the effect on diversity, we see a similar effect. Um, <clears throat> and it's not completely obvious why co-infection should increase diversity just on its own. Um, it's, it's because uh, of the, the effect of um, uh, what I've written here is it decreases the competitiveness of more abundant strains because if you have um, strain diversity and you have a strain which has a high abundance, then um, uh, uh, it can create more infections, but these can also um, lead to people being having multiple infections of the same strain. And this doesn't change the, um, in our model, this doesn't change the, um, the transmissibility of that strain uh, f from that particular person. So it's kind of, you kind of lose the advantage um, of, um, by having co-infection, you lose this advantage that more abundant strains have of creating more infections through, through co-infection. Okay, and so now if we just um, look at um, something which is kind of a bit more obvious, um, that if you look at, if we have an increase in prevalence in the population, we also have an increase in co-infection and that's just because the more infections you have floating around, the more likely you are that people will become co-infected. So in the end, we have this picture of how the within-host dynamics affect 
the diversity and the prevalence in our population. And it's kind of complicated, um, but what we can come up with that in order to balance and high diversity, what we know from this kind of uh, systematic look at the parameter space is that you need to have an intermediate to high strength of strain specific immunity, sigma. You need to have a low or an absent cross strain uh, uh, immunity strength, omega. Uh, and you also obtain the highest diversity when you have a low resistance to co infection, X. So that's great. We kind of we've narrowed down our parameter space to, to figure out how we can achieve this, this kind of um, pattern of transmission. Um, but that's all well and good. How do we obtain this with our model at the same time as that we can obtain um, low prevalence and low diversity? So these guys that I've mentioned here, um, these immunity parameters, probably aren't going to vary much between populations. They might vary a little bit depending on sites of infection and things, but overall, these are probably not going to vary much between populations. What's going to vary more is much more likely to be um, the transmissibility, so the, the basic reproduction number R0. So the question is that if we satisfy these conditions, um, if we increase R0, or, sorry, if we decrease R0, can we then achieve um, low diversity and low prevalence um, populations? So we asked, um, we asked the question, what further within those conditions must hold in order for this um, change in diversity and prevalence to result from a decrease in the basic reproduction number. So here's our real data, and this is simulated data. Uh, and so instead of having, um, so here the, the color represents um, the basic reproduction number. Um, here I have diversity, and here is prevalence measured at the, uh, once my populations have reached an endemic equilibrium. The shape of the dots refers to the duration of immunity that I've put into the model. So uh, diamonds represent a short duration of immunity, so here I've got six months. If I increase the duration of immunity, what I see uh, is uh, you lose diversity um, significantly. Um, uh, and so in, in order to kind of get this kind of clustered um, result here, when you reduce the, uh, the basic reproduction number, what we kind of see is that we need to have a short enough duration of immunity. So this is, um, leads us to our hypotheses for the within host dynamics it's a group airship um, based on our analysis of the epidemiological data. Um, we should have an intermediate to high strength of strain specific immunity, low or absent cross strain immunity strength, um, a low resistance to co infection, and a short duration of immunity. Uh, the next um, kind of natural question is, well, how short, how low, and how high? Um, that's kind of a bit airy-fairy. So um, we've kind of done as much as we can with this epidemiological data. For each population, all we know about it is um, the diversity of the strains in the population and also the prevalence of disease. In order to kind of um, obtain a more detailed hypothesis about the within those dynam dynamics of group I we need summary statistics um, which represent the transmission dynamics in these populations. So we, um, we have this um, longitudinal data in one particular setting. Um, so in the Northern Territory of Australia, we've got um, longitudinal data collected from 2,500 people in one um, population with a high uh, rates of rheumatic heart disease. Uh, this is the data kind of uh, represented here. So I've got time along the, uh, the horizontal axis here, and here I've, on the uh, vertical axis, I've got strain number. And where there's a green dot, um, this is just indicating that the strain has been observed at that time point. Um, so we have um, uh, the prevalence, so we have more than that, just this, this information. We have the prevalence of each strain at each time point um, in our uh, observed population. And from this, we can um, calculate more summary statistics. So here we've got kind of um, what we had before. So we've got um, the mean prevalence and mean diversity of, uh, of measured over the entire study period. We've also got the, now we have the variance um, of, this, um, of this summary statistic here, uh, of, this, um, of this measure here. Uh, we've got, and we've got six others. So we've got 10 summary statistics that we can get from this more detailed data for one particular population. Uh, and so this 
population has between one and 11 strains circulating at, uh, at any one time that we've observed in the population. And you can see that um, the strains kind of appear and disappear over the time period. So the question is, now that we have more summary statistics, can we learn anything more about our, our immunity parameters? And also, can we figure out what the basic reproduction number should be for this population? So in order to do that, um, we try and fit our uh, model to um, our uh, Northern Territory data. Uh, and we, because our model is quite computationally expensive, we have to be a, bit, a little bit clever in our fitting technique because we don't have the time or the resources to simulate our model 100,000 times. We only really want to simulate it maybe 1,000 times um, on, a, on a cluster environment. So our, our collaborators um, in Norway have come up with this method called BOLFI, Bayesian Optimization for Likelihood Free Inference. Um, it's similar to approximate Bayesian computation, which we heard about uh, in our uh, first talk today, but uh, it's, it has two advantages compared to ABC. First of all, it samples the parameter space in a kind of clever way using Bayesian optimization. Um, and an extension of this BOLFI um, framework, which we're using um, BOLFIRE, um, it allows us to actually um, automatically select the relevant summary statistics. So we have a list of 10 summary statistics. We need to kind of figure out how um, the discrepancy between these summary statistics and uh, in our simulated data and our observed data. So we have to come up with some kind of function of the discrepancy. And this um, extended version of this BOLFI framework allows us to do that. Um, so you can start off with a list of many summary statistics. It'll give you the weights of these summary statistics in the uh, calculation of the discrepancy function. <clears throat> and so typically this framework can allow you to sample um, orders of magnitude less um, in the parameter space than you would with just um, straight up ABC. And it does this by creating a statistical model um, created between the relationship between the parameters and the discrepancy, and then it uses this to figure out where it should sample in the parameter space. And so, uh, the first step in kind of fitting a model to data is to see whether your model can um, be fitted to simulated data. So this is not a test of whether the model is any good, it's a test of whether you can find out anything, any knowledge about your parameters um, with this um, fitting technique. And so what I've done here is I'm showing results when I'm trying to fit three parameters, uh, or to infer three parameters um, from simulated data. So I've just put, um, I've just, simulated my model under one set of parameters. Um, and uh, then I've used this fitting technique to kind of get back those parameters. Uh, and so this, these top row of plots here are, the, um, are just showing the discrepancy function. Um, and so the kind of the blue of the dot, the smaller the discrepancy between the observed and the simulated, well, the observed is our simulated data, but uh, you know what I kind of mean. Uh, and um, the, the parameter samples. And from this, we can um, get an estimate of the, uh, the marginal posterior distributions for our parameters. And so star is the actual parameters we put into the simulation, and the, the orange kind of blob is uh, the posterior distribution. And you can see that it's kind of getting um, the parameters back fairly well. Uh, and so the fitting to the observed data is a work in progress, um, but we're hoping to um, get some results soon. So that's kind of where we're at for finding out um, some information about the within host uh, uh, dynamics of group A strep that will allow us to build a more realistic model um, that we can then uh, uh, we can then test interventions with. So we can provide some advice um, to people about what to do about group A strep in Indigenous Australian communities. Um, so in order to make our model more realistic, what we're doing is we're including more realistic demography. Um, so um, we have uh, kind of a triangle shaped age distribution that we need to um, reflect in our model. Um, we've got age dependent contact rates. Um, and also we've got people assigned to households. So we're assuming um, uniform mixing in households. Uh, we're trying to figure out the best way to model short-term and long-term mobility between households. So in, in, in Indigenous Australian contexts, the idea of a household is probably a bit more fluid than what you might see in other places. Um, so household membership changes over time. You can get quite large households as well. So we want to kind of figure out how to best model that. Um, and we're also 
um, trying to figure out how we can parameterize these kind of household parts of our model by looking at um, whole genome sequencing data of isolates that we um, have um, of group A strep um, taken from two communities. So here I've just got um, uh, kind of a network analysis of this um, whole genome sequencing data. Essentially, the dots are households. The size of the dots represents the size of the household at that particular time point, so because it changes over time. And the edges between the nodes represent whether there's a transmission event. And the thickness of the edge tells you how many transmission events are between, going between households. And we can look at our community over time and see um, that the network is changing over time. But we can kind of look at um, contact well, transmission rates within and also between households and then also between communities. So in this last time point, when we look at our analysis, you can see that the community structure actually comes out um, through the clustering of the network. OK, so uh, that's kind of where we're at with um, modeling, getting towards a model to be able to look at interventions. In kind of related work, we're, what we're also doing is trying to use the model to test hypotheses about the infection requirements you need to see these disease, uh, these more serious diseases. So it's not known whether we need, you need a specific number of exposures during your lifetime, whether you need to be exposed to a different number of strains, um, or we just, we just don't know what leads to these um, uh, disease me, uh, immune mediated diseases. So we kind of test the model. Uh, we're going to use the model uh, to see what kind of infection histories we need to be able to see what we see in the data. OK, so I'd just like to um, thank uh, all of our partners in getting this work um, done. Um, so I've had funding through PRISM and Hot North and the University of Melbourne for this work. And these are our um, partners. And uh, the work is also being, um, is, makes up a part of this NHMIC project grant. Thank you.